So today's program, uh, The Roots Beneath Your Feet, the Homestead Act of 1862. Uh, so my park, Homestead National Historical Park, is dedicated to telling the story of the Homestead Act of 1862 and the millions of people whose lives were forever changed. So first off, uh, the basics. What exactly was the Homestead Act? Where and who did it apply to? When was it used? The Homestead Act was signed into law on May 20th, 1862 by President Abraham Lincoln in order to promote westward settlement across the United States. It was a revolutionarily democratic piece of legislation, especially for the time. It allowed any adult citizen or someone who is eligible to become a citizen the ability to become a landowner for free. So men, women, immigrants, African-Americans, Latinos, the Homestead Act was this accommodating piece of legislation that extended an invitation to the world. Now come here, get your land, settle. Uh, there were a few requirements to claim land under the Homestead Act. You had to be 21 years of age and the head of a household. So that meant that uh, single or widowed women could make a claim. You had to be an American citizen or eligible to become one. You had to build a house on the land and make actual settlement. And you had to improve the land, which meant growing crops or raising livestock, and remain on that claim for a period of five consecutive years. So my park is actually located at the site of the very first claim made under the Homestead Act by Daniel Freeman. Uh, he signed his paperwork just after midnight on January 1st, 1863, as soon as the law went into effect. Now, we're located at that site, but we're not, you know, Daniel Freeman National Historical Park. We talk about all homesteading, you know, millions of lives, uh, all the states in brown here that you can see on the map. So from Florida all the way to Alaska, those 30 states, uh, we're talking hundreds of millions of acres of land that was given away and uh, an estimated 93 million living descendants of homesteaders today. It's a big, big story, spans a, a huge part of American history. It lasted more than 120 years from the first homesteader, Daniel Freeman, uh, to the very last homesteader, Ken Deerdorf, who received his land in Alaska in the 1980s and is actually still living there today. To settlers, to immigrants, to homesteaders, the West was a promising, empty land. But to Native Americans, it had been home for untold generations. Land laws, including the Homestead Act, negatively impacted the lives of American Indians across the United States. They believed that that land belonged to the community, not to individuals. Senator Henry Dawes of Massachusetts argued that Native Americans could prosper if they owned family farms, if they had 160 acre farms just like a homestead. His 1887 Dawes Act led the federal government to carve up Native American reservations into these in individuals uh, allotments and broke up tribal lands even further than they already had been. And at first that sounds similar to the Homestead Act in what it's trying to do, but it's important to remember that this was already Native American land. Uh, they, they controlled the land that was being allotted to them in the first place and uh, much of what was being allotted was not the best farming land. And after tribes claimed their allotment, the remaining tribal lands uh, were declared as being, uh, quote, surplus lands, and then given up to non-Indians opened up for homesteading. Uh, if you're familiar with like the Oklahoma land rush, that's exactly what happened there. And, and these land runs allowed that uh, land to be opened up on a uh, first come, first serve basis. And again, significantly contributed to the dispossession of Native American lands. The Homestead Act was specifically designed and passed into law by the 30th, uh, 37th Congress of the United States of America to distribute public domain land to uh, private ownership, including to immigrants who sought to become citizens. When Congress debated this law, that ability to draw in immigration uh, was uh, debated in Congress. Congressman Isaac Newton Arnold of Illinois stated, quote, there are immigrants from the old world ready, so soon as you pass this homestead bill, to go upon these wild lands and convert them into productive farms. So one thing I, I like to uh, draw attention to, when 1862, when the Homestead Act was passed, the cost to rent, not to own, just to rent one acre of land in England 
was actually higher than the cost to file your homesteading paperwork to own 160 acres of land in America. And it's something that was heavily, heavily advertised, heavily promoted, not just in America, but all across the world. We can see advertisements and, and flyers here uh, in Montana, you know, come homestead in Montana. And there are literally gold coins that are spilling out of the earth as you plow. And, uh, millions of acres available in Iowa and Nebraska. And the, these ads talked about, you know, the, the golden opportunity and uh, just the land of plenty and anyone can come out here and be successful. So it's no surprise that immigrants were thinking about homesteading. There were several different uh, factors that led immigrants to look to the United States in the late 1800s. There were push factors, things like economic hardship, uh, crop failures, overpopulation, which uh, strained rural farmers. And many of those farmers and, and their children thought, well, I want to keep doing what my family has been doing for generations. And nowhere looked like a better place to do that in the late 1800s than in the United States to take up a homestead. Many early immigrant homesteaders were farmers who owned a little land in Europe, or perhaps the younger children of those farmers who, under land laws at the time, had very little chance of inheriting land. So the opportunity to own 160 acres in America, when farmers in the old country might have 20, 30, possibly even 40 acres of land, you know, that's, that's a lot more land to work with. So as more people immigrated and sent word back home, uh, communities would spring up and, you know, come on, it's, it's great. This is our chance. So that had an immediate impact on immigration patterns in the United States, especially in the Great Plains. The 1870 census, so the first census after the Homestead Act was passed, shows that New York's foreign-born population was 26%, the highest of any state on the Atlantic coast. However, this was well behind some of the homesteading states. If you look at uh, Wyoming and Montana, nearly 40%, uh, the Dakota Territory about a third, even Nebraska's one-fourth is about the same as New York. So the percentage of foreign-born individuals in these states uh, just very, very significant. And the uh, absolute numbers are just exploding from the 1860s to about 1900. Uh, you know, these populations are going up hundreds of percent, uh, two, three, even 400 percent. And uh, the correlation doesn't end there. The peak years of immigration to the United States and America are about 1900 to 1915, which are also actually the peak years of homesteading, uh, about 1900 to 1920. So the tremendous boom of immigration around that time period uh, provided the numbers to uh, create both ethnic and religious-based uh, community formation. Homesteaders, when they came to the United States, brought their culture and traditions when they claimed land, whether they came from Germany or Scandinavia or the Middle East or even just elsewhere in the United States. Uh, they often created these uh, purpose-built communities along kinship lines, ethnic lines, or uh, shared religious bonds, trying to uh, uh, recreate the places that they had called home before uprooting and staking this new claim. When homesteading, there is this intense sense of isolation uh, and a tremendous difficulty in creating a farm out of basically nothing. And so community was a very, very important part of homesteading. The ability to receive and provide assistance in times you know, both good and bad meant that a, a safety net and the camaraderie of having neighbors, having a community, were super important. So the rural heartland, these uh, isolated homesteading farms, uh, would often go hand in hand with a central town site. As settlers came in, they, they needed a town, uh, maybe a, a general store, a post office, a blacksmith, a stable, a mill, an implement dealer, uh, just anything that might help out on the farm make life a little bit easier. There is always a, a sense of optimism and even speculation in creating these new towns on a a boom bust sort of cycle. And one of the most important things that could make or break a, a successful community was the railroad. Uh, there was very little river transport in this part of the country and travel by wagon was slow and expensive. So towns basically needed a railroad to be economically prosperous. Towns that were passed by often were, were doomed. Not only did they not have the railroad, 
they were then directly competing with a nearby town that did. And so many merchants and, and townsfolk would simply just move to this new railroad town. These towns were an economic necessity on the prairie. They served as the, the central hub of commerce and social life and a place to provide goods and services for homesteader families. They tended to be a, a little more middle class, merchants, bankers, doctors, lawyers, things like that, uh, had social organizations, fraternal orders, uh, veteran societies, things like that. Uh, the towns and the homesteads in the area were mutually dependent uh, but often had a little bit different spheres of ethnic, religious, uh, cultural backgrounds. Generally, cities and towns were more likely to be born in America and farmers themselves more likely to be immigrants. Religious identity for homesteaders uh, was often closely tied to ethnicity. Many arrived in clusters or groups and created colonies, these dedicated communities with a certain uh, church or faith as a key component of that identity and often became even more devoted to that faith in the United States than they had been in their home countries. There were homesteaders of many different faiths and backgrounds, uh, Jewish homesteaders, Orthodox, Muslim, uh, LDS, Mennonite, Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, and many more. They settled together in clusters and built dedicated places of worship as the glue that held their community together. Many congregations did struggle with population density on the prairies. Often it was simply too large of an area settled too loosely by too few people. Still, it was a, a very important part of building and sustaining a community beyond just the religious aspect, uh, the uh, important social and recreational activities, dinners, uh, women's and youth groups, uh, Generally, men led these churches, but women were sustaining them in the communities around them, planning activities, preparing food, raising money, and maintaining community institutions. When the first members of the LDS Church entered the Salt Lake Valley in the late 1840s, the earliest federal titles to land in that area weren't actually issued until 1870. It was actually the last place in the continental United States where public domain land or homesteading land was opened up to private ownership. The first land office didn't come until 1869. So when that land office opens in 1869, uh, Utah residents were finally able to claim homesteads, purchase lands, uh, essentially asserting rights to what they had previously legally been squatting on. And so when you're uh, doing genealogy, often in a location you'll see no records at all until a certain point in time and then all of a sudden just this huge boom of paperwork and documentation. Um, so here in, in Utah, you'll see that. Uh, Mormon migration and settlement patterns from the Salt Lake Valley uh, spread widely in the late 1800s and clustered together in colonies that designed group settlement. Uh, from the 1860s, hundreds of new colonies were established in the West, in Idaho, in Colorado, in Wyoming, in Arizona, uh, Nevada, and Montana. And the 1880 census report uh, said of Utah that it was dissimilar to any of the other territories, a case of steady regular growth due almost entirely to its agricultural capabilities. So homesteaders coming in seeking more land and, and wanting to farm. So here we can see uh, the uh, LDS community and uh, town of Grovant, Wyoming which was established by uh, 27 LDS homesteader families coming from Idaho in the 1890s. Uh, one of the leaders of the community was James May, who settled his extended family and then brought his neighbors in, in an example of uh, what's called chain migration. Uh, the stake to claim in 1896, along with James Budge and Leroy McBride, who all three successfully homesteaded by 1903. And, uh, aligned the town. You can see in the, the center of that map there, uh, the, the road going through town aligned along that in what's referred to as Mormon Row, which is now a part of Grand Teton National Park. In fact, quite a few national parks, especially in the western part of the country, have homesteads in them because they were originally public land before they were turned into national parks. A post office was established in 1901 as more and more families settled in the area. And uh, by 1915, 
there were the uh, 27 families, all with 160 acre claims. And they built a church in 1916 and a school in 1922, right in the middle of the community there. With the establishment of Grand Teton National Park in 1950, new settlement was closed and uh, land use there changed from homesteading and agriculture to tourism with families leaving the area in the 1990s. But homesteaders and immigrants came from all over the world. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people came to the United States from what was then the Ottoman Empire uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It was ethnically and religiously diverse, but many of those ethnic and religious minority groups experienced persecution and oppression, leading them to come to the United States. And immigrants from all the groups you see on the screen here, Syrian, Lebanese, uh, both Orthodox and Muslim, Greek, Armenian, and uh, Turkish, all came to the United States to homestead. One of the largest groups from what was the Ottoman Empire were the Christian Assyrian Lebanese. They settled all across the United States, but two of the most prominent homesteading communities were in North Dakota and in Oklahoma. Uh, both examples of chain migration where an individual or family migrated and then convinced family and friends to come join them. With the requirements of homesteading to provide witnesses to your claim, these chain migrations can be quite evident. You had to have four witnesses, which would usually be neighbors, friends, um, often members of a, an ethnic or religious group uh, that would swear to all the, the details in your homestead. In North Dakota, in Pierce and Williams uh, counties, the Cassis family immigrated from Syria. Uh, Regina Cassis brought her children with her to Williston, North Dakota, after her husband passed away in Syria in 1896. Several of her sons filed and successfully proved up claims, and uh, they had four claims in Williams County and another four in Pierce, with more than 1,200 acres of land total between about 1903 and 1909. Regina herself made a, a homestead claim in 1903 for 160 acres and received it in 1908. There were other neighboring uh, Syrian Lebanese families in the area, including the uh, Habib, Buslaman, Farah, and Shikani families. Though many homesteaders stayed on their land for generations, some even to this day, uh, for others, it could be a means to an end for some other lifestyle or profession. Uh, the Cassis family used their earnings and windfall from the land they received. Uh, they sold it and then pursued their dreams in town. They, opened up several stores, including an ice cream shop. You can see the advertisement for that here, as well as a uh, candy shop. In Greer County, Oklahoma, there were uh, several families from Lebanon, the Massads, the Koris, the Rashids, and the Shadids. And again, with that, that chain migration, uh, most of these families did serve as witnesses to other uh, Lebanese claims in the area, which is how I first detected that there was this community in the first place. Uh, Joseph Massad staked a claim in 1899, as did Shaker Kori and uh, Joseph Massad's brother, uh, Shaker Massad, uh, the following year. And by 1905, there were five proved up homesteads for men born in Lebanon in the 1870s. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about using records, using the general land office records, using tract books, using witnesses and case files and in newspapers on how to track down some of these linked members of an ethnic or religious community. While most of the migration out of the Ottoman Empire in the late 1800s, early 1900s were Christian, a large number of those who chose to homestead it near Ross, North Dakota were Muslim, uh, mostly from Syria and Turkey. At the turn of the century, a group of approximately 20 Ahmadiyya Muslim families from Damascus filed on homesteads in Mount Rail County, North Dakota. There were initially questions about their naturalization and citizenship status as uh, normally potential homesteaders had to be eligible to naturalize and become citizens. Uh, in total, 41 declared their intention to become citizens, 34 Syrian immigrants and uh, seven Turkish immigrants. And in total, uh, the community acquired thousands of acres of land in the area, 
uh, through the Homestead Act and several related land laws. The initial wave of homesteads in the community were proved up or bought out by uh, 1908, including by the Shadi family, the Ish family, the Juha family, and the Farat family. And the uh, community continued into the area well into the 1940s. The uh, last homestead claim was uh, issued in 1949. So the fact that we're talking, you know, thousands of acres of land in rural North Dakota over a period of 40 years, it's, it's a pretty substantial and long lasting community. I think one of the most fascinating elements to me was the importance of their faith. A, a contemporary newspaper reported, quote, they have their own place of worship and conduct services each Friday, as well as on other holy days. So this mosque in a, a small Syrian Muslim homesteader community in North Dakota was actually the first purpose-built mosque in America. Uh, it was built in 1929, several years before what's now referred to as the, quote, Mother Mosque of America, the oldest standing mosque, which was built in 1934. Scandinavians also took advantage of the Homestead Act, immigrating to the U.S. and claiming land in their own name. Uh, Minnesota, of course, famously heavily settled by Scandinavians, but far from the only place. Uh, pictured here is Maggie Walls, who's a, a Finnish immigrant, homesteader, and suffragist. And she actually created a homesteader colony, that's a, a community of Finns, on Drummond Island, Michigan, uh, part of the Upper Peninsula. She became a federal land agent, so in charge of distributing land, and directly promoted in Finnish language newspapers, you know, come out to my colony and, and we'll have this Finnish community. Uh, she promoted making a living from the land through farming, uh, which many Finns enthusiastically supported, you know, valuing their own land and having a family farm. Uh, by 1911, her community had a, a combined population of about a thousand people. Also in the Dakota Territory, a heavily settled Scandinavian colony in Devil's Lake or Spirit Lake, North Dakota. Uh, now this community uh, settled on a reservation, the Spirit Lake Dakota Indian Reservation, participating in a land run, sort of like what happened in Oklahoma. So uh, directly contributing to some of that homesteading uh, land dispossession. And by 1930, Scandinavians owned more land on that reservation than Dakotas did. So big picture of the Homestead Act. Uh, it was in effect for 123 years, 1863 to 1986. 30 of the 50 states had land settled under the Homestead Act for a total of 270 million acres nationwide. Women, African-Americans, Latinos, and immigrants who were eligible to become citizens could all claim land under this law and entire communities all across the country formed around uh, often either a shared uh, ethnic or religious basis. As many as 4 million claims were filed and there are an estimated 93 million living descendants of homesteaders today. While it's not the focus of the program today, I wanted to briefly mention some of the other things that we've got going on at the park. We do a, a lot of uh, research trying to share the many, many different stories of homesteaders. Uh, so we've got our Black Homesteader Project, helping to share the stories of African-Americans who took advantage of the Homestead Act. Uh, we have a Women Homesteader Project, looking at their role in the suffrage movement, as well as a project to map out and include in a database the homesteaders from all across the country. So I'd like to do a, a little of a, a deep dive into some of the resources and tools available to do uh, genealogy research for homesteading. So first off, these are uh, some of the resources that are available digitally that I highly recommend. The General Land Office Records, so that's what we'll start with up at the top there, uh, but also Ancestry.com if you've got a membership there, has digitized homestead land entry case files, uh, on Family Search, you've got track books as well as canceled and relinquished uh, entries. And then the original paperwork is all kept at the National Archives. So we'll start off with the general land office records. So this is a uh, free federal resource. There's no username or login required. It's just 
uh, glorecords.blm.gov. So we'll start off by going up to this green bar, search documents. You click on that and it will pull up this interface where you can search documents by type, uh, by location, by identifier. Uh, you can look up patents, surveys, land status records, uh, control documents, and track books. Uh, I recommend starting with a search of patents by type. So first select your location, uh, the state, and if you know it, the county, although that's not necessary. If there's a specific name you're looking for, uh, input at least a last name. I actually recommend uh, just a last name first, and then if you need to be more specific, you can. Uh, if there are uh, spellings that are, are alternative or different, you can also use a wild card by typing in the percentage sign. You can add other information if you need to be more specific, a legal land description, a land office location, a year range, or an authority or the, the law that something was issued under. Depending on what you're searching, there could be dozens of options. It'll show you all authorities, all names in that state uh, that claimed land. So since I'm talking specifically about homesteading, I'm going to go ahead and drop that authority down to Homestead Entry Original. Uh, so the Homestead Act of 1862 is specifically what it's going to post up. Uh, there are several different homestead laws, and, and the total number of authorities you can search uh, nationwide are literally dozens. So you don't need to search this, but if you're trying to be more specific, it can certainly help. Uh, so I'll try a search for uh, one of the members of the Muslim homesteader community that I talked about in Ross, North Dakota. I'll look up a, a homestead for the Juma family. And when I originally ran that search for Juma and homestead in North Dakota, uh, I only got two results, both the same person uh, with claims in two different counties. There you can see the Hassin Allah Juma in Mount Rail and in Stutzman County. And sometimes you might be running a search on this website and thinking, now, wait a second, I know for a fact that this isn't right. There's something missing here. So, uh, Often names might be written down incorrectly or even spellings changed over time. And so I figured, well, that's probably what's going on here. So I opened it up with a wild card. You can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, what I ended up doing instead of typing in Juma, J-U-M-A, is I typed in J-U uh, percentage sign. And then I actually got rid of the land authority so I would get more than just homestead. So I got any land that belonged to a J-U something and so by casting that wider net, I see a, a Juha, a Juma, and a Juma, J-U-M-M-A. Uh, so again, names often misspelled or altered by those that were recording the data. So using these wild cards and common misspellings can certainly help you find things. So I went ahead and I clicked on Amid Ase Juha, and we can see a lot of information even just on this, this basic index here. So we can see the total acreage there, 160 acres, issued on September 21st, 1908. So that's the date that the individual was officially patented the deed from the land office. Uh, there's a map based off of the legal land description using the public land survey system. Uh, so this particular claim uh, at the 5th Principal Meridian, Township 156 North, Range 92 West, in the Northwest Quarter Section of Section 35, Mount Rail County, North Dakota. Now, I thought that this was a homesteading community, but it says here authority, and the law it was granted under, is not a homestead. It says sale, cash entry. So I, I'm, I'm sort of perplexed by that, and we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit here. But a couple of other things that you can find on this website, the patent image. Uh, so that is the deed to the land. And then the related documents, that will show you uh, neighboring claims. So again, if you're doing uh, a cluster research, if you're looking for family members, uh, often you'll see that in the related documents. Now, another very important resource is the Bureau of Land Management track books. These are available through FamilySearch. So FamilySearch is free, but unlike the Glow Records, it does require a login. So you have to create an account. 
Uh, you can find this by going to uh, Family Search and looking at their catalog and then searching Bureau of Land Management. Now, uh, it says here that, uh, you know, you can browse 943,000 images or whatever that number is there. Uh, you can't actually search by name. It doesn't work very well. So I do recommend clicking on the Browse All Images. And then that's going to show you all of the available track books uh, for a certain state. So when we click on North Dakota or Dakota Territory, uh, we see that there are literally hundreds of books and each one of these books is like 200 plus pages. So if you don't know which volume you need, it can be sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, so I recommend using the tracked book coverage table also provided by FamilySearch, uh, which lets you know what volume you need based off the legal land description. So we looked up that legal land description earlier on the GLOW records. Uh, we know that we're looking for a homestead or a claim in Section 35 of Township 156N, Range 92W. And so when we look at the coverage table, it tells us, okay, Dakota Territory Volumes 185 to 187. And it's going to be towards the back of that because it's near the, the end of that 156 range. So when we go ahead and look up volume 187, uh, sure enough, I found it in the track book there. The arrow points to it. And it's uh, a little hard to see this, so I've got some zoomed in images. So just that first page here, uh, we can see at the far left, uh, that first column where it says HD, uh, which stands for Homestead. And going all the way down, HD, HD, HD. So these are all homesteads. So, aha, it was a homestead entry after all. Uh, sometimes you'll also see home or HE for homestead entry. Uh, other notations you might see are pre-PRE or pre-41. That's a preemption claim. You might see desert for Desert Land Act, TC, timber culture, tons of different codes. Uh, so some practice needed to sort of figure them all out. You can also see in this column the legal land description, so that next row, the acres, uh, all of these are 160, and then the price paid. Now, since it was a homestead, uh, the land itself was free, but there were filing fees you had to pay. So these are all uh, $10, $10, one of them is $14. Uh, so those are the fees you paid. If you see a larger dollar amount, something like uh, $200 or $100, uh, that is the price paid for you know, if it was $1.25 for 160 acres, that's a, a purchase of $200. So also listed on this page are all his neighboring homesteaders. Uh, again, great way to see other members of the community. So then the second page of this track book, uh, Juma's claim was the one that, that was filed up on that second line there, October 17, 1906. Normally, a homestead took five years to prove up. You had to be on that land for five years before you could officially own it, before the land was yours. But after being on the land for a little over a year, he chose to do something called commuting a claim. You could uh, essentially say, you know, I want to actually just buy this out. I want this land to be mine sooner. And there are a lot of different reasons folks would choose to do that, um, usually based on the fact that, you know, until you owned it, you couldn't. Uh, for example, mortgage it or sell it or do whatever you wanted to do with it. So he chose to commute it. He chose to buy out his remaining time. You can see where it says uh, cash uh, and then the patent number there. So he ended up buying out his claim uh, for cash. Now, another important uh, resource are the land entry case files. We've been working on a homestead records project. Uh, there were millions of pages of documentation uh, created by these homesteads. Each and every single homestead had a written record case file that was kept by the United States General Land Office. Today, they're stored at the National Archives. Uh, since 1999, we've been uh, working with the archives to digitate, uh, uh, digitize all 30 million pages of documents. So, so far, you can see the states in the green are the ones that are fully digitized and available online on Ancestry in a partnership with them and uh, working to get the rest of those states in white also digitized. Now, if you have family in one of those other states, don't despair. Again, we've got those GLOW records, we've got the track books, 
uh, all sorts of index information. And of course, the case files are always still available in hard copy in the National Archives of Washington, DC. Now to pull up the digitized ones on Ancestry, we go to the card catalog, do a keyword search for the word homestead. Uh, it'll be the third one on the list there, US Homestead Records 1863 to 1908. So go ahead and click on that. And I went ahead and did a search for James May, who is that LDS homesteader in Wyoming who helped create the community of Gravant. Uh, so you open up the case file by hitting that little view button, little green button there. Uh, these case files are usually about 20 pages long, and they uh, have all sorts of great documentation on the claim, on receipts, uh, you know, the filing fees that are paid, affidavits, wis uh, witness testimony, and uh, claimant's testimony about what they were doing on the land, uh, posting of notice in the local newspapers, so witnesses for cluster research, uh, You'll have very detailed information, things like the size of the house, what outbuildings, what crops were planted, even like the exact date they arrived. If they were in the military, you'll find military service records. Uh, if they were an immigrant, you'll find their citizenship and naturalization paperwork, since that was a requirement. Just a lot of different types of records and data all kept together in one file. So just like this genealogical treasure trove of information. They're just super, super cool things. I've even seen some that have, you know, hundreds of pages of uh, court records. Of, you know, I I've seen like murders on homesteads that have the, the trial records for that. So just all sorts of information available in these case files. So the receipts and affidavits, I mentioned that the land itself was free, but that you had to pay filing fees. So that'll tell you basic information like you know, how much uh, they paid for their filing fees, but also when exactly that process started. So you have a, a, a bound date. You know that at least by this date, your family member was on that land. Uh, so at this point, they're basically swearing that they're going to meet the requirements of that law, that their citizens were declaring their intent to become one, uh, making a claim for actual settlement and uh, uh, agriculture, uh, cultivation of the land for their own purposes. You had to post notice in local papers saying, you know, I, John Fairchild, am taking this homestead at this uh, particular parcel of land. And part of that was for uh, basically fraud prevention, alerting community members that a certain homesteader was about to finish their claim and calling witnesses to testify on behalf of the claim. So uh, in this case, we can see James May's witnesses include James Budge, uh, another one of the early Mormon homesteaders in Gravant. And actually by looking at this homesteader's witnesses, I was able to find uh, that the daughter of one of the witnesses created a manuscript about her time growing up in that homestead and community. So you can find all sorts of supplemental information to flesh out stories that you may not have even known existed. One of the most valuable uh, resources available in these case files is often the testimony of the witness and of the claimant. Uh, they're often in these uh, uh, pre-done uh, questionnaire types that ask the same questions both of the witness and the homesteader themselves, several pages of detailed information where exactly and when exactly settlement was made, who lived on the claim, you know, were there other family members, a spouse, children, uh, if they were ever absent, why and when, what crops did they have, you know, oh, I planted 20 acres of apple trees and had 40 acres of corn and seven cows. I had a, a 12 by 18 foot sod house and a dugout and a corn crib. So just a very, very rich source of genealogical information that literally may not be recorded anywhere else. Uh, again, I can't stress enough how great this can be for cluster research. We can see the witnesses here, James Budge, Joseph Henry, Albert uh, Nelson. Uh, so these uh, notices of the neighbors in the community, uh, take those names and the information provided, figure out if they were homesteaders. And you often find, you know, once you find one homesteader and look at their testimony and you find four more homesteaders and suddenly you have dozens of people in this community that you're able to map out and figure out their relations to one another. 
And then if you're looking for homestead land entry case files for those states that aren't yet digitized, uh, you can always request a NATF 84 form uh, from the National Archive. So the link here will get you there. Uh, of course, you can also visit in person and, and do research if you're ever planning on doing, going to Washington, D.C. And then uh, I just wanted to close by saying, you know, first off, thanks so very much for attending the program. But also, if you have any questions on anything I talked about today, any research or reference assistance, if you've got genealogy that you're interested in looking up, you know, maybe you have homesteaders in your family tree. Uh, that's that's literally what we do. We're happy to help. We provide free research and reference assistance. You can call the park at the number on the screen here or send us an email. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those now. There are definitely questions. Uh, if you wanted to leave your slide up with your contact information, I think people would love to have that. Yeah, let me share that back here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's great. Uh, I just want to say a lot of people in the chat uh, were just saying how much they loved your presentation. Uh, from people who are beginners to people who are well versed in using the records. So, thank you for that, really. Um, so, the first question this was asked very, very early on in the presentation asking if somebody filed in Alaska. I'm not sure who they're referring to, though. If they know who, who you're referring to, I'm going to have them put that in the chat and we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. Um, okay. So early on, you had a map with that was very colorful. What were the what was the significance of the colors on the map? Uh, so the the states in brown on that map are all homestead states. So basically. Uh, any state that wasn't one of the original 13 colonies or the states that were created out of land in the 13 colonies. Uh, so most of the Midwest and Western states have public land. You could homestead in those states, you could buy land in those states. Uh, so those are where you're going to find records on what I talked about today. Great. Okay. So this question, um, if Deirdre filed a claim in 1974, why did it take until 1988 to receive his patent? Didn't it, was it supposed to take five years to do the improvements? Because that would be 1979. Yeah, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. So uh, it should have happened faster than it did. Um, but it wasn't uncommon in some situations to take longer than five years. Uh, five years was sort of the minimum. It, it had to take five years, but you could get an extension. You know, maybe the, the crops were bad one year, there was a freeze, or, or you just needed a little more time to prove up the land. Uh, specifically in Deerdorf's case, uh, part of it was that he was in such a rural area, and, and even though it was, you know, Alaska 40, 50 years ago, so not that long ago, uh, it was such a rural area that uh, the survey took a little longer than it, it should have taken. And before it was surveyed, you, you just couldn't officially finish the process. And it seems almost like the, the Bureau of Land Management in Alaska sort of forgot he was there. Like, oh, we need to get this guy his paperwork. So uh, he, he finished well before 1988, uh, but didn't officially get the paperwork until then. That that tracks. Not not to <laughs> knock the federal government, but that, that tracks. Things are just slow to happen. Uh, great. Um, so somebody was asking how, there were two questions about how long the land was available. One person, uh, part of their question, I think you answered already. They were asking not just how long the land was available, but were freemen able to buy land? Can Native Americans get land? Uh, it could formerly enslave people by the land, but then somebody else was also asking kind of in the same vein as far as like how long it list it existed. Um, when those records stopped, so when they stopped doing them in the seventies, was it because there was just no more land or was it because the government 
was just not wanting to give out land in the West anymore at that point. Yeah, so. that's that's a great question, sort of a, a multi-part question. So let me try yeah. and tackle it all. Uh, so basically land opened up when it was officially surveyed and uh, that process happens at different times in different parts of the country. Uh, the earliest surveys happen in Ohio and the Ohio River Valley around 1800 and and the latest surveys especially when you're looking at like rural Alaska don't happen until well into the 1900s so it's it's a very gradual process but most of the land in the continental U.S. would have been surveyed by 1870, 1880, somewhere around there. Uh, and then once it's surveyed, it's it's officially opened up. You can go to the nearest uh, federal land office to, to file your claim, either start a homestead, buy the land. And that land would be available to anyone who was eligible to claim it. So specifically with homesteading, the requirement being that you had to be eligible to become a citizen. So African Americans uh, receive uh, the ability to become citizens after the uh, Civil War. So the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, between 1865, 1870, I believe, uh, uh, are what grant African Americans the ability to become citizens and homestead. Uh, so that starts right after the Civil War. Now, Native Americans uh, don't universally received citizenship until the 1920s. Uh, there were special cases where Native Americans could uh, essentially, especially if they're treaties, uh, become American citizens by basically renouncing tribal citizenship. So it was a, a very uh, difficult uh, decision to make. You know, well, I can homestead, but I'd be having to renounce my citizenship and, and no longer you know, officially being a tribal member. Uh, so that does happen in some situations. It's not terribly common, uh, but it, you could, as a Native American, uh, start homesteading as early as the 1870s. Um, and Asian Americans uh, are not guaranteed citizenship all the way until the 1940s. So there, there are Asian American homesteaders, again, relatively few, just uh, based on the requirement of citizenship. So the Homestead Act itself didn't restrict on race, but it, it did require citizenship. Uh, so the earliest Asian American homesteader I found uh, was a Japanese man in the 1920s who uh, essentially bought out someone else's homestead, so sort of got around the citizenship requirement. And, and then you start seeing more, um, especially like post-World War II, I've seen uh, Japanese American veterans uh, often veterans received homestead land, so World War II, Japanese-American veterans homesteading uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. But then the uh, last part of the question about, you know, how late did it go? When did the land start uh, basically being taken out of the pool? Uh, so there was a law in 1934, basically in the middle of the Great Depression, if you're familiar with the Dust Bowl, so a lot of homestead land in the Great Plains and uh, sort of getting out towards the West was in land that was affected by the Dust Bowl. And so in 1934, there was a law called the Taylor Grazing Act that said, you know, folks have been homesteading on these dry lands for generations and, and it's just taking this huge ecological toll as farmers year after year after year are plowing and tilling the soil and, and just damaging the soil uh, more and more people every year. And so they took most of that land out of the available pool for homesteading in 1934. Uh, it does technically continue all the way up until 1976 uh, in the lower 48 until 1986 in Alaska. Uh, but after the 30s, it does get significantly reduced. So as you were talking, I had actually put links to a bunch of the resources you mentioned in the chat. So everyone's like, can I get a copy of the chat? If you'd like a copy of the chat, please send us an email to genealogy at acpl.info, which I'll put into the chat for those who need it. Okay, so that's great. That's a wonderful, well-rounded question. Uh, we don't by chance know the name of the first person to Homestead, do we? So Daniel Freeman was... Daniel Freeman, okay. And it, it's one of those things where there are several claimants to being first and, you know, yeah. with... The, the technology of like, no one was clocking in 
uh, yeah. in 1863. But so one of the criteria we used, there were uh, something like seven or eight people that all claimed either at or before uh, January 1st, like like midnight January 1st, 1863. Mm -hmm. uh, of those yeah. people, Daniel Freeman was the only one who then successfully proved up his claim. So basically he was the first at the very beginning, but also went all the way through to get the land. So that's how we made that distinction. Right. Um, so we do have a number of questions in here. If we don't get to all of your questions, feel free to send us an email. And Jonathan had his email uh, up on that slide a couple minutes ago. So definitely contact one of us if we don't get to all of your questions. Uh, the next question, somebody was wondering, how would you find out what happened to the land after that was granted? Um, would there be records with the BLM or another agency showing the terms or were not met to keep the land? So did someone not do what they were supposed to do? Yeah, so uh, basically once the land was successfully proved up or purchased, uh, the federal government stops tracking it at that point. So uh, once it goes from federal ownership to private ownership, the GLO no longer tracks it. There are, you know, uh, state databases and county level, you know, if you go to the, the county courthouse, you can then track, you know, all the way from that original ownership in 1872 or whenever, uh, all the way to the present. Uh, but the federal government no longer tracks it. Now, if you tried to homestead and didn't make it, which about 50% of homesteaders never got their land. Uh, so that land basically would go back in the pool of available homesteading records. And uh, that can even be tricky to, to trace too, because the the records I talked about with the, the case files, those were only kept for successful homesteaders. Unsuccessful homesteaders, there are some, uh, but they're they're not nearly as, as well documented. So one of the best places to see the 50%, so a large percentage of people that weren't successful, uh, again, is in the tract book, that, that book we were looking at. So that has everyone, uh, whether they made it or not, they're at least recorded there. So if you have someone that you think, you know, I, I know they homesteaded, my family says they homesteaded, and you don't see them on any of the things we talked about today, uh, tract book is going to be your, your best bet. So kind of in the same vein, somebody said, um, if you find an ancestor that has exactly 160 acres of land in a state that was a homestead state, is that a, just a good indication that they should start looking for those records? Yeah, the odds are, are pretty good. If you're in any of the Great Plains states, any of the Western states, uh, basically between like 1870 and 1920, the odds are very high. Yeah. And if they themselves weren't the homesteader, then, you know, if they bought the land, then whoever they got it from uh, probably was, so. Okay. So the next question is very specific, so brace yourself. Um, they This person said that they found their ancestors in the federal track books for Oklahoma. It was a married couple however, did not receive their final patent. The wife first applied in December of 1897. Um, O.S. Brayland canceled May in 1901. Her husband then filed, then had his entry in May of 1901. So they, like the first one, it sounds like she filed and then it was canceled, and then he filed, and then it was canceled again in 1902, and the final pen went to someone unrelated with the entire thing in 1902. So there are a couple and of everything has that, its own certificate number. <laughs> there are a couple of different things that that could be. So uh, one, the rules for married couples changed a few different times from like. 1888 to 1905 and and you know at first uh, if you were married you could only get one homestead and then they opened it back up well the husband can have a homestead the wife can have a homestead and then they changed it back to well you could both have homesteads but you have to live on first one finish that then get the other live on that and then they changed it back to no just the one homestead yeah uh, so depending on how those laws were changing and, and when exactly it was that could be a factor for now, oh, well, the law changed, so we have to get rid of this one, uh, and that's the better one, so we're going to keep that one. 
Um, but then also you could functionally transfer a homestead. You know, you've met all the requirements, you were on it for your five years, uh, you basically owned it, but you could say at that point, uh, I'm going to transfer it to that person, they're going to pay me, and it's now theirs. Uh, so without seeing the documentation, it's, it's hard to know for sure, but one of those things might be what's going on. And if you send me an email or give me a call, I'd be happy to, to figure out exactly what's going on with it. Great. Okay, so we are almost out of time. So we're gonna do one, one to possibly two more questions. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to find one that actually works. I will say this person also had asked, um, since each entry has its own certificate number, can you then go use those certificate numbers to find the land claims? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that first website we looked at, the General Land Office Records, that is one of the things that you can type in. If you know, you know oh, I have right here a homestead certificate, 12345, and you type in, you know, Wyoming, 12345, it will uh, pull up, you know, John Smith got this land in 1907, and it was 160 acres, and here it is. And so, yeah, you can search that way, too. Great. Okay. Okay, so this person was asking the difference between two different kinds of patents. So uh, this person's second great-grandfather from Pennsylvania applied for a homestead of land in Minnesota in 1878. He stayed there with his family until 1892 and then sold the land and moved the family back to Pennsylvania. He also had a timber culture patent. What is the difference between this patent and the homestead land? Yeah, so you could basically stack different types of claims. You could have a homestead, you could have a timber culture, you could have a, a sale, you could have military land. Uh, you know, each individual claim was capped at 160 acres, but if you did, you know, five or six different patents, you could end up with a thousand acres of land like that. Uh, a timber culture, uh, think of it basically like a, a homestead, but for trees. So you didn't have to live on a timber culture claim, you just had to grow trees. Uh, initially, if you were doing 160 acres, you had to plant 40 acres of trees. They later reduced that down to 10 acres of trees. Uh, the whole thing with that being, you know, the Great Plains are not forested at all in, in most of the Great Plains, right? So it was this government effort to plant trees so that there would be timber for use as a resource as more and more people were coming out to settle. Uh, so many, many people did actually do both the homestead and then uh, often on like an adjacent parcel do a further timber culture claim. Great. Okay, so we've had a couple of people ask about this. So this is going to be our last question. But as I said earlier, if, you know, there are a lot of questions still left in here and y'all keep adding more, um, send us an email, send Jonathan an email. We're all more than happy to help you. Uh, our email is, I see my Kate, my colleague Kate put it in the in the chat. It's genealogy at acpl.info. Okay. Um, also, if you like a copy of the chat, email us for that as well. Uh, so th this person had asked, Ken, what is the website where you find the application to get a homesteader's full case file and what application they need to submit and where to submit? Yeah, so the uh, NATF 84 form with the National Archives. Uh, so I don't remember the actual website. It's sort of a, a long hyperlink. But if you literally just go to Google and type in NATF 84, uh, that'll get you the... Oh, I just, I just yep, put it in the chat. It. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. It helps to have multiple monitors. You could Google <laughs> things very quickly. Yeah, so this is... You just submit this... Um, does it say how much it costs to actually get these records? Uh, I want to say that it's around $40 to submit a request. Gotcha. Okay, great. So we are just about out of time. Thank you, John Jonathan, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us. Uh, just as another reminder, everybody, this is the first 
program of Family History Month, which what an awesome program to start out Family History Month. We have a lot of things coming up the rest of the month. I just put in the chat a link to where you can look at all of our upcoming programs, so definitely do that. Uh, well, thank you all again, and I hope you have a good day. Bye. You'll have a good one.